Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of um, Twice Removed. I'm Natalie Pithers, a genealogist. Um, uh, you can find me and all the other Twice Removed interviews on www.genealogystories.co.uk. And I'm so pleased that I remembered for a second week going, <laughs> second week running that I remembered to introduce myself. Yay. Although I have just edited my intro video and uh, played it and then noticed that I'd missed um, some of the text on it, updating it to my latest font. So nearly there. One day I will get a perfect interview introduction. <laughs> But, um, but much more importantly, I'm joined today by Dr. Sarah Reid. Sarah, it'd be lovely if you could um, introduce yourself to everybody. Hello, yeah. Uh, my name's Sarah Reid and my day job, I work as a lecturer in English at Loughborough University, um, but I'm also um, a novelist in my spare time as well. You've got it all going on. Mm. <laughs> you must be so busy. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> That's the way I like it, though. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, I wanted to start by asking um, probably like the most obvious question, but I've tried Googling it and no matter how many times I Google it, the, it, the answer never sticks in my head. So can you tell me when was the early modern period? Hmm. Well, it's one of those one of those that everybody's got their own answer for. But essentially, it means post medieval, just before okay. the modern era. So um Everybody's got their own sort of interpretation of exactly when it started, but um, you might want to think about it from the terms of sort of the Reformation up until the Industrial Revolution, even it can go that far. Um, but every, as I say, everybody's a bit different. I tend to sort of be mainly 17th century based, but it's the start of modernity, if you like. It's the start of a, a society that's very much got things in common with ours, that was, you know, that's recognizable to the way we live. So, start of modernity, really. That makes it really clear. Thank you. That's much clearer than any of the explanations I've read, actually, because, uh, yeah, I think it's when you um, when you look for the answer, you find so many different time periods, it becomes quite confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that you're a lecturer in English at the University of Loughborough. Um, could you tell me what is a literary historian? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of historian that um, also incorporates traditional literature into their research. So um, plays and poems are, and are all source texts for me in the same way that perhaps a medical textbook would be. And I can give you a really good example when looking into how early modern women managed their periods at this time. The most unlikely source, which was some really filthy poetry from uh, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, had got more to say about it than most, most of the writers. <laughs> I think that's great. No, I can I can relate to that because my uh, my degree is in English, and I think that was my English lit was kind of my introduction to history. Um, mm. So I can I can relate to that a lot. So um, can you tell us? So you mentioned about periods there. So I wanted to um, start with uh, um, actually what it was like giving birth in the past, mm. um, mostly because I think as when we look at our ancestors, and we quite often find women who. Um, who died not long after childbirth, um, or women who had like 10 children um, and, and things that maybe aren't quite as um, common as they are today. Um, sorry, yes, yeah, so they're not common today. Um, it makes me certainly think about what the experience of giving birth was like in the past. And I just wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So in, um, in early modern times, giving birth, is it was quite different really from um, our experience, most people's experience today, because everybody gave birth at home, their home or somebody else's home. So some, some women went home to mum, a few people went to the midwife's house, but nearly everybody else gave birth in their own bed at home. Um, and it was an all women environment in the 17th century. So you'd have your midwife, you'd have your friends and your neighbours, you might even have some frenemies there, they obviously could be quite fraught, you know. <laughs> And, uh, but your your female circle, um, and they would be called your gossips, um, and it comes from the same root as godparent, so sort of God's helper, um, and and their job would be quite a physical one actually to help the labouring woman, so to give her drinks, mop her brow, but actually also to climb up behind her and sit and prop her up so that she could give birth, sitting up on the edge of the bed with support, holding her hand, stroking her belly. Um, so that, that, that's essentially how um, experience of childbirth was at this time. It was a reciprocal thing. Um, you know, you'd be you'd not, your neighbour for your gossip, they uh, gossip for your neighbour, they'd be one for you um, in due course. Um, 
so that that's your main difference really is is it is a room in your house um people would often swap out their good feather mattress for a straw one if you're not going to want to ruin oh. the best one so even quite high up well to do ladies went into the straw to to give birth because then you could take it out into the back garden and burn it and you know nothing lost um so so that was quite a common practice as well um, but yeah, I think that that's that's the main difference is is it the home environment and the the female camaraderie that that went on in births. That sounds quite hectic. Well, not hectic, but it, I get this picture of quite a few people in the room. Is that would it be common to have sort of what five or six or more? Yeah, or? yeah. yeah. I mean, so between this you and your midwife, and then you know you've got your perhaps your mum, your mother-in-law, a couple of neighbours, friends. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, it could get quite crowded and it could get quite noisy if people had different ideas about the right way to proceed. And that's one of the jobs of a midwife would be to keep order, um, you know, make sure that things progress in the best interests of the labouring woman. Um, but if you look at any of the pictures from the era of a post-birth, you know, recovery, they are really crowded scenes. And, you, you know, once the men are let back in and then there'll be this drinking and eating and you see, they've always got dogs in. All these pictures have got dogs in. <laughs> <laughs> and children playing and <laughs> just exactly what you might think of as being a bit of a nightmare when you just give them birth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I certainly, uh, my, my first pregnancy was, um, uh, I had a really, really long latency labour and then I had quite a complicated birth um, with a with a kind of big red button emergency C-section and um, yeah, it was it was quite scary. And the thought of there being lots of people in the room, mm -hmm. just like, oh no, thank you. But, um, but on the other hand, knowing that you've got that support when things um when things do get difficult and um i, I know when i gave birth um my midwives were all brilliant and i i really relied on them and there was something you kind of bond with these people temporarily for 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 the hours that you're in hospital but you don't ever forget them um do you think do you think that was the same in the past as well do you think um that you're more, more likely to know your midwife personally i suppose yeah, I mean, I, I like you, I, I remember the names of all the three midwives that delivered my three children and always will. Um, and, you know, it, but I think in the early modern era, in the 17th century, um, midwife was somebody who was in your, you know, your local town, your local village, uh, who everybody knew. Um, and you would call for her and you'd want the midwife that you had the best relationship with. If you lived in a town, there might be two or three. So, you know, you'd, you'd pick the one that you'd got on best with. Um, and so, yeah, it, it very much a personal relationship. Uh, and of course, if you were having the average is, is five to seven babies in the 17th century. So, you know, you, you see a lot of each other. Really. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, you, you wouldn't want to get on a bad side, really, would you? Yeah. Especially if you're in a small village. The last thing you want to do is annoy your annoy your um, annoy your midwife. So. How did where you give birth, that giving birth in, in home, did that change over the period? And, and if so, sort of how and why? Uh, yes and no, I think is the best way of answering that. Yeah. For most people, no. You know, most people up until the 20th century, nothing changed. And um, community births, as they were known in the early 20th century, were the norm for the vast majority of our um, foremothers. What did change from the early 18th century onwards is this introduction of what they called lying in hospitals and they were dotted around the capital um big cities scotland um and you know so there was a few of them grew up in the 18th century and that was more like a maternity hospital would become um in later periods but that's only a very small percentage of women having that experience as i say from most of us even up until the 1900s, things were very, you know, home birth was the, was the very much the norm. Okay. And the midwives themselves that were working at home, were they, um, were they well paid for their work or um, what, what were their lives like? Um, they varied. There, were, there was um, several sort of different groups of women who were attracted to, to working as midwives. Some of them were quite well to do, you know, the gentlewoman, um, maybe the wife of a merchant. Um, the, I, I wrote the um, Oxford Dictionary of National Biography Entry for a woman called Elizabeth Whip who died in the 1640s. And she was a merchant's wife and she left quite a lot of money in her will, you know, several hundred pounds and clothes and bits and pieces. 
for her family in a will. So they were quite well to do. So she would sort of be the upper echelons of, of, a, of a community midwife. Um, but then they could, they could be from any rank. Um, the unqualified, if you like, as, as much as anybody was qualified, w- weren't called midwives. They were called hand women, you know, from the same derivation as farm hand. Um, and so they, they'd be sort of more, the woman in the area knew, knew a lot about giving birth and was people wanted her there to support them and not every not everywhere had a fully licensed midwife anyway you know um but where you did have one um she was trained by apprenticeship so she'd be deputy to a practicing midwife for three to six years okay and when she got to the end of her training she would deliver half a dozen women maybe more on her own who would then be able to vouch for her skills and say how good she was at her job um, and that would be the end of her apprenticeship but to get her license she didn't do exams or any of the things that we we think of now she'd have to go before the bishop and get a church license so uh, midwifery licenses were issued by the church um, and the the midwives so that they'd have to swear it's quite a big deal. It, um, the, there was one published, there's several versions of it, but one that was published from the 1640s had 15 points in it that a midwife had to swear. Um, so that was that was in conjunction with her testimonial. So she would need um, the signatures of the women who she delivered or their husbands to sign on their behalf. Um, there's one that I use um, as inspiration for somebody in the novel, uh, the gossip choice and it's a midwifery license of Mary Thorne and there's a there's a list of about 10 men and it's the wife of such and such the wife of such and such you know and, that, and it's the men who've signed to say um, that she was competent and from the mid well first third of the 18th century you find that there's a little bit of a change in the licensing documents in that doctors and or other men seem to be vouching for, for midwives as well as the women that they delivered. So that's a bit of a social change that goes on then. But I've got some points from the midwifery license if you want me to. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. Thank you. Yeah. So the first point is that you had to promise to help rich and poor women alike and not to leave a poor woman's side because a rich woman wanted you and you would get more money, which I think is quite a, quite a nice one, isn't it? To, you know, to promise that you'll treat anybody in the order that you called. Yeah, that's interesting because it suggests that, so, that that perhaps before they put that in, that was a problem, you know, that, or they were preempting it being a problem. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, and you had to promise to send for help when needed. So, you know, not to just sort of wing it and think you could get, you know, if it got out of hand or beyond mm-hmm. your skills, you had to promise to send for help. Um, you had to, if there was any doubt who the father was, this is quite a horrible one, if there was any doubt about who the father was or we did, just didn't know, one of the midwife's job was to get that information out of the labouring woman. So to harangue her while she's in labour to to to, to, fight, to to have her name the father. But it was a double-edged one because she had to promise uh, that she would get the right name. And... <laughs> <laughs> not the labouring woman just name anybody just shut her up you know? <laughs> yeah, so I knew about the name but I didn't know that little nugget that they were they were under pressure to make sure it was the right name I mean gosh yeah well, the were terrified about being at the charge you know for a, for a child that they've got to raise when some some uh, father should be paying the maintenance um and they, they've had to promise not to use any witchcraft or charms okay <laughs> and they um had to promise if the baby died that they would give it a proper burial. And obviously okay. a, an unchristened baby couldn't go in consecrated ground in the churchyard. So the midwife's oath says that it's still got to have a decent burial somewhere that it can't be dug up by a dog or a hog. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. It's 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 really hard, I think, for us to comprehend that that sort of strict rule like oh, because because the baby's not christened it's got to go in on consecrated ground I think that's quite alien to us today but mm-hmm. at least they were considering that they had to be well buried yeah and it was it was your job to make sure that you know quite a decent, decent burial yeah okay yeah that's <laughs> That's some interesting points there. I quite like I quite like the witchcraft one as well. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be quite up for having some witchcraft whilst I gave birth, to be quite honest. 
<laughs> um, talking of which, how how dangerous was giving birth? Actually, um, less dangerous than people tend to think. The vast, vast, vast majority of labours proceed without any intervention. Um, and the, the in the sort of late 17th century, the mortality rate is a lot lower than it is in, say, Victorian England. Okay. Um, there's all sorts of reasons for that, uh, one of which is that the involvement of surgeons and, you know, they've just come from a post-mortem or from doing an operation and they wipe their hands on their apron and then they go and help you give birth and they pass on all sorts of germs. Whereas in, in periods when it, you were at home with just a group of women, if it was a straightforward birth, then they were less likely to be introducing infections. So uh, mortality rate is about 1.7%. So, you know, one and a half women per 100. But obviously, the average birth, as I said earlier, was five to seven per family. So that's cumulative. But I think the thing about it is that we all know 100 women in, uh, we've heard of. Um, so we'd all know of somebody. Um, yeah. And, it, and it's a lot on women's minds that, that they could die, you know, that this is a dangerous passage. There's one one midwifery guide that um, uses shipwreck analogy, you know, getting into safe harbour and that type of thing. So, you know, it was it was known to be a dangerous time. But really, it's much less dangerous than popular myth will have it, you know. Okay. Do you, is, is, am I right in thinking that some people had, if they could afford it, they would have their portraits painted when they became pregnant or before they became pregnant, just in case they passed away? Is that is that a myth or is that something that we think people really did? No, there are there are quite a few pregnancy portraits um, around, and but only amongst the upper echelons. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. very expensive very expensive to do what there also are are a few um mother's legacy books printed so there was uh, three or four um that came into print some were reprinted quite often and these were instructions to children from the mother if she died you know, this is what me writing to you if i should die and i'm not here to tell you myself one of them even includes names for her grandchildren that she thought she'd quite like <laughs> <laughs> But mainly they were to do with being being godly, you know, and being brought up in in, uh, in a proper way. Um, so yeah, mother's legacies were a thing as well that some of the uh, more well-to-do women would do. Oh, that is sad. <laughs> um, am I right? Also right, like in thinking that um, that in some ways um, I can't know how to word this. So I I thought that um, that. Midwifery started off as, like you say, women, very women centric, and then um, as as centuries progressed later in the time towards the Victorian times, men started getting more and more involved, mm. and um, and in some ways they made giving birth more difficult or um, more painful because they did things like saying um, like give birth lying down, for example, whereas previously women had had you know tried to let gra gravity help and. Um, had things like the birthing stools and the um and yeah just just like you said sitting up to to give birth is that a myth or is that um is that accurate or accurate-ish ish <laughs> like all things like a lot of these things really so yeah in 17th century england women gave birth upright unless they were poorly it was it was, wasn't really a thing to to lay flat well people didn't lay flat anyway they slept propped up um because on, on bolsters because um digestion was thought to be inhibited by you laying flat which you know we, we know you get a bit of indigestion sometimes if you lay flat that type of thing so there's, there's you know there's sensible reasons for it but people early when people did sleep on bolsters and cushions propped up a little bit not fully upright obviously but just reclining and so if you think about it it's logical that they wouldn't then suddenly decide to get to go on to the flat of the back to, to give birth but um birthing chairs quite elaborate affairs in wealthier families something very much like a dairy stool in ordinary families uh, and then you can see why the role of the gossip was so important because if you're sitting on a little um three-legged v-shaped stool you're going to need somebody behind you holding you yeah um, absolutely yeah. And, and then you've got your midwife crouching down in front of you but um some physicians would write that the most common position in england was that women seemed to favour, because it was a cold country, although it doesn't feel like that today, um, was sitting on the edge of her bed. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because then you've got the bed curtains keeping the, the wind off. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so did they, I, I was meant to say as well, if anyone's watching and they want to comment with questions, please please do feel free. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Um, 
so did they have any sort of pain relief um, for whilst you were labouring um, or, or was it completely natural? No, no, there was pain relief. Some pain in labour was expected. We had Eve's curse to thank for that. And so um, good Christian women expected to be in pain, um, to travail in sorrow, as the Bible told us. Um, but that made, didn't mean that they had to be in unimaginable agony. Our midwives had a whole array of um, things they could turn to to help help speed the birth up because that was what the main treatments seemed to do and they start off quite gently so you might have a bit of cinnamon in some um some wine things like that all designed to open the body and just to help things along loosen the passages um and then they get more and more um strong so you could eventually end up with sort of opiate type um treatments you know if the labor was excruciatingly bad um and they had things that we would find quite odd now, like um, suffumigations. So when a mother was sitting on the birth chair, which essentially is like a loose seat without the front, um, they, they could put some aromatic herbs in a chafing dish and burn them. And then the fumes and smoke would go up her bits and, and help open up everything. And, um, and, and so, you know, there's a whole range of, of things that they would be willing to try. Um, but a lot of it is the things that are popular now, you know, active birth, walking about the chamber, supported by your gossips, but keep active until until you absolutely are ready to push. Um, walking up and down the stairs, anything that can help, very recognisable today to, to uh, modern birthing practices. Yeah, actually, I think in some ways... Um modern birthing practices in in very recent years have started harking almost back to the past um with um sorry sorry i just had a really loud motorbike go past and i couldn't hear myself um yeah um with, with things like um uh, doulas and um and a rise in in giving birth at home and things like that as well so um if you did get in in difficulty um just thinking like myself of needing a c-section was there any um was surgery at all available and forceps um things yeah, like that I mean, or yeah absolutely but they weren't the, they weren't the purview of a midwife um okay so if you got into difficulty the midwife would send for a surgeon okay but realistically when things went wrong they went wrong um it might only be that one percent but you know it, it was a tragedy because there's very little anybody could do there were forceps from the early 17th century, um, but one family kept them very close by um, for a whole century, the Chamberlain family, um, and didn't let anybody see them. So when they used them, they went through to all sorts of um, secret, you know, putting cloths up and things so people couldn't see them. Um, but by, by the 18th century, surgeons have got, um, have got a sort of forceps that are recognisable as the same thing that are used now, the same sorts of looped blades, very similar, uh, and could help that way but one of the things as well with the midwives they says is that you're not to mess about with women you know you're not not to try and hurry things along inappropriately because there was very much a feeling that the the hand women you know the, the untrained the ones who hadn't been through the apprenticeship were forever interfering with women trying to open up things and, and get things moving along too fast okay um, yeah yeah which comes with a whole new, another set of dangers doesn't it like preeclampsia yeah. and yeah so um so after you'd given birth um, how do people feed their infants? Um, was it, did everybody breastfeed or um, wet nurse or was there alternatives? No, there was no alternatives to, to um, breast milk in one form or another. So if you couldn't breastfeed yourself for any reason, then wet nurses were, were the answer. Um, they tended to be really things that the upper ranks did. Um, but even then, from the early 17th century, that changes. So in 1622, you have um, a text come out. It's only a short pamphlet, The Countess of Lincoln's Nursery. And here, she's the Dowager Countess. Um, so she's very high ranking. And she writes a whole treatise saying, you know, it's not right to not feed your own children. Um, it's a job of work that God's given you. She had 18 children and didn't rescue any of them. Because um, that's one thing you find, although the average is five to seven, as I keep saying, it's seen by the upper classes who had lots more, you know, lots of children, so they, that affects the average. Um, yeah, her husband wouldn't let her feed any of them himself because it was seen as a job of work. Okay. 
Yeah. And we were up a ranking. It cast aspersions on the husband's status and his wealth if he was having his wife doing manual work. So she writes this treatise in 1622 dedicated to her daughter-in-law, Bridget, who is feeding her own children. And, and the Countess of Dowager Countess is actually blown away by this and thinks it's amazing. And it's opened her eyes. And, and she can only write it because she is a dowager and she's got no husband uh, telling her she couldn't do it. But you know, so she lays into him in this treatise and says it was all his fault and she really regrets it. Um, but she says, you know, what an inspiration Bridget is. So you see that as part of um, becoming... Um, in the Protestant tradition from the early 17th century. Um, if you got into trouble, what you find is breastfeeding is much more um, communal. Um, so for the first three days, um, they didn't think contrary and completely counterintuitively that cholesterol was any good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Until your proper milk could come in, your friend or your neighbour, or sometimes your mum if she just had a baby, would feed your child. Again, another one of these reciprocal gossiping duties. And then when your milk came in properly, you'd take back over. Um, people of middle ranks often sent their children out to nurses um, and the baby would go and live with somebody else for its first year. And I mean. It was weaned and toddling. And, and you see lots of diaries noting that, you know, they went to see their child on a Sunday afternoon and it was doing well, or sometimes just the dad goes, you know, and pays a visit. Um, but that's something the Countess of Lincoln thinks is terrible as well. Now, in retrospect, she didn't think it was necessarily terrible when she had all these <laughs> 18 children herself, perhaps. But, yeah, I mean, she, she said, there's all horror stories, you see, of, of children dying at the home of the wet nurse being overlain which you see on the bills of mortality quite regularly. And that means that somebody, you know, that they suffocated when the nurse overlay them and slept. And then there's all sorts of implications mm -hmm. about nurses doing it just for money and being drunk and, and, and things like that uh, as part of the propaganda against uh, sending your child out. But yeah, there's no alternative but a woman's milk one way or another. Yeah, sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. That that fear of um, of wet nurses and, and and nurses in general and sending your children out that that prevails for centuries and centuries, doesn't it? Because I, I you know I've read newspaper accounts of similar sort of fears of a nurse being drunk and yeah, which, which quite naturally. I, I mean, even today, I think you worry about who's you know you vet your child minders and you worry about it and all those kind of things, don't you? So, yeah. um, so what bef before women became pregnant <laughs> what did they understand about their own reproductive cycles do we think lots more than you think really i mean i think our attitudes to women's reproductive cycles has been skewed by the sort of 20th century and they well you know let's not talk about things like that and uh, and um although women do keep it private privacy is relative so if you're a family and you're sharing a chamber pot then people are going to know things that are going on in ways that we can't imagine yeah absolutely yeah. um so we girls did know that they'd start having periods as, as a fact of life um and also because in the 17th century the body was thought of as being a balance of humors it was also thought to be a very bad thing if your periods didn't come on at puberty so because your humours were all skewed with then and you were going to be gathering up too much blood and you could become ill. And what you find there that's interesting is that the surviving letters are often written by dads to physicians saying, you know, I'm worried about my teenage daughter. She's 16. She hasn't had a period yet. And I don't think she, you know, she's in very good health because of it. What do you advise? Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. I would have thought there would be a male female to taboo divide i guess mm. um so that's very interesting i think dads had a vested interest in their girls growing up to be good wives and and not being <laughs> not having a cycle meant that they weren't going to be yeah. part of that yeah so um so we so you think teenage girls expected it and Ooh. and were waiting for it okay okay so um oh sorry i have just I just lost my mouse there. That was really random. <laughs> just scrolling down to make sure I got all the questions in. So, how did they cope with their with with their periods? Because um, I'm already thinking, did women wear knickers by this period? No. So, how did they cope with their blood loss? Um, well, again, that is to do with what rank you're in. Um, essentially, I've got some here, little linen cloths. <laughs> 
rags, linen rags. Cut out bits of linen rags. And that's all anybody who did use anything did. So you might fold them a couple of times and then sort of, you know, scrunch them between your legs and get on with it. Yeah. And then they would be boiled and reused and, and so on and so forth. And these were made out of old 90s, old shirts that would go through various stages. In it, linen is this commodity that goes on through, it has several lives. And it's really interesting because it's one of those things that's made quite often at home. So people who, who had land would grow the cotton flax um, and then, you know, weave it and go through all the stages and bleaching it. Um, could take a whole summer because you lay it out on the grass and it had to um, it had to go through several months of that before it was considered ready to use and then it then it would be in garments it would be in pillowcases it would be tea cloths any household cloth was the word clout in front of it and the clouts so dish clout um, and clouts were bits of linen made out of other things okay. um, not good linen and and then eventually they become the clouts that women would use the time of um, but also you know your nappies um in the toilet um and then there was a stage after that for, for these because they would be collected and then they could would be sold to the rag woman and then they would go into the paper making industry okay yeah so they just they just were washed and then reused and then when they had completely had it you'd recycle them yeah that yeah, makes sense yeah, quite like that. Why not? But quite a lot of ordinary everyday women just didn't didn't have the capacity to even have spare spare rags for that. So there's an awful lot of what we would call free bleeding going on. Yeah, um, and that goes on into the 19th century. Um, there's lots and lots of stories of women working in the cotton mills and, and factories where there was sawdust on the straw for that purpose because they didn't wear knickers and it was just the done thing, the normal thing. Yeah, people didn't, because um, we. I think it's become associated with a hygiene thing, hasn't it, mm -hmm. over the centuries? But that that's obviously a much more recent invention, I suppose. Okay, that's interesting. Um, oh, somebody's just commented actually to say, um, my mum was a teenager during the Great Depression. Um, she spoke of wearing the the reusing the diapers they had worn as babies that's interesting yeah the, mm. they, it would make sense wouldn't it why not because it's been it's not something you're going to want to do anything else with it so, you know, no, i'm going to make it into a hat oh you know sure so yeah i mean that's coming back into to fashion isn't it a lot of women now are opting for reusable washable sanitary protection and so that's that's another thing that's come full circle yeah absolutely absolutely and, and i think we are trying to um break away from this constant association with it as, as unhygienic, which is not helpful at all. Yeah. Um, so in terms of things like, um, you know, having period pains and cramps, was there um, sympathy for that or an understanding that, you know, because that could be pretty debilitating, especially when you're your earlier periods, I think, um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think there was sympathy for that. Um, treatments tended to all be, um, a variety of getting things out of the body. So purges, things that would make you sick, things that would make you go to the toilet, um, things that would you know, open up the vessels to help get this out, to help encourage the blood to get out um, was, was thought to be the, the best thing for that. Um, Bloodletting was used widely, um, to, um, people being um, cut in the arm or various other parts of the body to take out some blood because it might be thought that the reason that you're having period pains was that your blood was so full of humours that were bad that it was thick mm -hmm. and so you want to thin it out by taking away some of the excess with period problems you tend to have your blood let in the ankle on the okay. thing that it would all flow down and out of the body so okay. there's a chart where in medical books where the best place to let people's blood from for different conditions is we are, but it isn't very often or normally. Our poor ancestors must have been so anemic. If you think about how their diet compares to ours, and then you're, you know, you're having a period which can make you a bit anemic anyway at times, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, somebody's trying to bloodlet you, and then you're working all these long hours as well potentially. I just, I don't, 
I, I find it almost like unfathomable how they got up and carried on working and how they carried on doing things because I, I would just be a mess on the floor, I think. I just, yeah. I think it's interesting as well. There's a class divide there where it was expected, even in uh, medical books from quite well renowned um, famous physicians, that you know, upper ranking women who sat around all day doing a bit of embroidery and not, not working would have pain, more painful deliveries, would have more period pains than. Um, a woman who was labouring in the fields all day, who were very much thought, you know, have stronger bodies and would yeah. get. Well, there's probably there's probably is a bit of logic to that, really, isn't there? Probably, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I do. I do constantly wonder how they did it. And then and then you read um you know, you read novels and sensationalist novels with all these ladies fainting, and you think maybe maybe there's this tiny nugget in there where women did faint more than we do now because they were all anemic. <laughs> And overworked, and I mean, and being being seriously anemic is not pleasant at all. It's a really no. bad feeling. Um, uh, yeah, so no, they, they, my ancestors have my sympathy on that front. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, one of the treatments for anemia was what they called steel waters, which is iron iron infused waters. So they did know that iron okay. was very good for anemia, and there was a t particular form of anemia that teenage girls were susceptible to, um, and it was called green sickness, and um, it was if they hadn't started their period yet and there are various other um, symptoms. But green sickness and is now thought of one of these sort of pernicious anemias that young girls, teenage girls can get. Um, some people have likened it to tyranorexia and things like that. You know, they go off your food and so lots of similar symptoms. But obviously we wouldn't retrospectively diagnose people because mm. it's all a different era. And the, the symptoms you tell your doctor about are determined by the culture you live in. But... It is. It does not seem, you know, that it responds to these steel waters, as they call them. And so that might be why you take your daughter to a spa. OK, um, yeah. To drink the, to drink the um, sulfur rich or, or iron rich waters. Um, and that would bring their periods on. And because obviously, you know, if, you, if you're not a healthy BMI enough for your cycle to start, it's not going to do. And, you know, and that also... It's to do with your anemia levels and your iron levels. Yeah, um, so they were alert to things like that, you know, much earlier than you might than you might think. And is there is there anything that they said that women couldn't do or shouldn't do whilst they were on a period? Because it, it sounds very much like they just got on with it. But um, is there is there anything that they kind of you know weren't allowed to do? There are, well, it depends, again, <laughs> on who you are, like you say. <laughs> the likes of me would have had to get on with <laughs> things because there wouldn't have been any, any other choices. Um, but different societies had different rules. And one of, not periods so much, but bleeding after, a, after you've given birth, um, women weren't allowed to go into church until that had stopped. Okay. Um, and then women would have a, what they call a churching ceremony where they would be welcomed back into the family of the church because obviously, again, the connections of Eve's sin and childbirth and purification then needed after you've been through that, um, that process. So um, after you've given birth in the 17th century, you would have a period of rest and it was an extended period as well. The woman's month was named because it was meant to last a month. Um, okay. So you to stay in your bed um, incrementally rise. So for the first three days or so after you've given birth, you weren't even supposed to change your sheets, like, you know, get up and change your sheets. Um, you were meant to rest properly, um, yeah. you know, keep a dim light because your eyes could be sore. And then bit by bit, by and by, you, you know, you get up a little bit more to the stage where after a couple of weeks, you know, you'd be pottering about in your bedroom quite fine. Um, and by the end of the month, you would be in your house, but you wouldn't go out. Um, and then at the end of the month you would go to church and have this big celebration um, and it started off in in the early part of the period being at the church door and then when you'd had the ceremony you, you were allowed back in but they eventually it just ended up being a few words in the church um, but it's one of those ones that throughout the 17th century goes in and out of fashion um, as the civil wars affect who's in charge and what they believe okay. in so, you know, it stops for the period of the uh, Cromwell's. Um, well, it period. would, wouldn't it? Typical <laughs> Cromwell. <laughs> uh, it starts again afterwards. I, I like that. The um, it, There's a lot of logic to that as well. Like, I, I know after I... Um, after I gave birth, I was itching to get up and do things and 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 then sometimes overdid it, um, especially because I'd had surgeries. But um, yeah, uh, 
I think I would have found it very difficult to not do anything for a month. But on the other hand, I think my body probably would have thanked me for it, you know, especially because it can be so exhausting giving birth. It's not a, you Again, know, for some people. Things with a lot of a lot of logic behind it, isn't there? I mean, mm. if you've got little tears and things like that, then just sitting and resting and letting yourself get better. It's got a lot to be said for it. Um, but again, it's so class centered because yeah. count, upper ranking women would take six weeks without thinking about it. So they're, they're lying in, um, which is where lying in hospitals get their name from. Their lying in could go on quite happily for six weeks. Um, and they, you know, they, they'd milk it for all it was worth. They'd be receiving visitors and, and getting presents and, and being made a fuss of. Whereas your um, washerwomen will be back at work in two or three weeks because they can't afford not to. There's yeah. no incentive. And yeah, of course. Yeah. If you've got a, a family of several small people and your husband and you're working from home, most people's businesses were at home, no matter what it was you did, it was in you know, a cottage industry, then the dad was having to, to not work as hard because he was going to have to take over some of the domestic responsibilities. Obviously, your friends and your gossips would, would do that as well. But it impacted on everybody. So, you know, very, you know, you'd have to be lucky to have that luxury of a four month. Yeah, 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 I can imagine actually. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> I definitely would want to go back in the past and be a rich person and all <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so moving on to later stages of life, uh, what did they understand about um, the menopause and, um, and what were their experiences of that like without HRT? <laughs> yeah, there's very little written about um, the menopause it's not a name that actually exists until um, hundreds of years after the 17th century. So it's a little okay. before we get the word menopause and we import it, we borrow it from the French. <laughs> and, um, so it comes in quite a lot later. So you you see it as just sort of written down um, the cessation of the term the end of periods. Um, but it was known to be the end of the woman's fertile period. And for some women, this was a sorrowful time, you know, if they were still hoping to have more children, if they'd lost a lot and they were still hopeful that there'd be some to come along, they could be sorry. But for other women, it was quite liberating, you know. Um, they could think, well, no, you know, at least I won't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. So there are um, leaflets, pamphlets that was that were sold in town squares offering miracle cures for things like flashes, hot, hot flushes. So, I mean, symptoms were known about um, and, and expected. And, and you do see all the sort of um, tropes that we associate now with women who are post-menopausal, you know, sort of hairs on the chin and this type of thing. So it was understood to be a process, but ageing in general was thought to be a drying out process <laughs> in the funeral system. So you, you, when you're youthful, you're dusty and moist moist body becomes slowly <laughs> slowly withered and dry dry and shriveled yeah. yeah exactly that um and so you know menopause fits entirely with that because if you're getting drier and drier then so you haven't got the spare blood that you need to get rid of so you don't have your periods anymore but it was completely and fully known that the link between um periods and babies so yeah. the common phrase was that there's no fruit without flowers so the, the most common name in the 17th century for a period was flowers so you and i would say well, you know are you dewy flowers that type of thing mm -hmm. um and, and so you know it would be normal for people to to refer to to not being fruitful anymore um no fruit without flowers that makes a lot of sense um uh yeah <laughs> So I just, I just caught up on the whole drawing out, trickling <laughs> as you get old. It does make a lot of sense, though. If that's how you, if that's how you understand the body and medicine, it's all, it's all so logical. Um, and um, I suppose less women. I did less women go through menopause because women died younger. Um, you know, or do you think it was just as prevalent? You know, I don't know what the average age of death was um well the average age of death is is late 30s but that's very skewed by the number of children who die yeah okay yeah sure so sure. if you can if you can get past 25 as a woman there's no real reason why you wouldn't get to 60 or or okay. longer so you know if you can if you can go through the key sort of changes and you know if you get through child rate the younger child re um rearing years um, if you, you know, deaths in childhood were horrifically high, um, starting with, you know, the first year, then through to the fifth year, mm. to 
um, fully a third not surviving to 15. Um, you can see why the figures, no matter how many people lived to an older age, would, be, would bring that bring that average age down to the mid thirties. But no, there's lots of accounts of, of women who lived to remarkable ages, really, and um, in the diaries or the letters, they'll moan like anything about the the problems of aging and how horrible it is and, and things like that. Um, and do you think people learnt about the about periods and um, what childbirth was going to be like and, and menopause? Do you think a lot of that came from people's mothers? Uh, it was just um, one of the commenters, Jackie, here has just said she thinks that your mother probably had a role too. Um, do you think that's that's accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As we started off saying, you know, in the childbirthing chamber, there was. Quite often, if your mother was still around, she'd be there, and and as would you know your mother-in-law, whether you yeah. <laughs> whether that was a good thing or not. Um, and and generally female relatives. So yeah, I mean that's why it's it's hard to find a lot of surgeons because a lot of it is already passed between mothers and daughters. Um, one of the places you can find that is in women's receipt books, which is their name for recipe books, and they're often passed down between mother and daughter, and they often contain recipes. For what we euphemistically call women's problems, um, you know, in large numbers. So yeah, uh, and you, you can see them being passed down in wills. From okay. The yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'd it'd be interesting to hear with the Paul Couchman, who I interviewed about um, Regency cooking, whether he's come across any of that actually. So I know he's a he's a recipe collector. <laughs> um, so what about if you? Um, yeah, it's it's in, interesting actually. Just thinking actually, what you what you're saying about um, about women, because I think sometimes when we look at the past, we can think that uh, fam family relationships weren't as close. Um, you know, you talk about perhaps your infants going off for a year. Um, you think about infants dying young and having to accept that to a certain degree and get on with life. And sometimes I think that can give you a bit of a skewed picture that people didn't have the same um, or didn't have to the same extent that that familial bond or, or 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 love even or relationship but actually i think when you look at um <clears throat> the things that you're talking about like women supporting other women i think that's um evidence that it that it was there and in in the same way as it is today oh, um, yeah i mean there, there's some harrowing stories there's um lady Anne fanshaw talks about one of her um little girls dying and it's the most moving thing ever in her memoir because it's her and her, her, and her husband's under the side of the grave and wish they could they just feel like jumping in and mm -hmm. I, i'll never forget that because it's just so evocative isn't it you could just sympathize so much with that impulse and then um the gardener the diarist john john evelyn who was friends with samuel peeps in the restoration his daughter dies of smallpox, and he writes so movingly about it. I mean, there's no doubt at all that um, family bonds are, are as loving as, as, as ever we could wish them to be in very many cases. Yeah, no, I agree. I've certainly come across, and again, I know it's later, but I've come across... Um, plenty of newspaper reports of, of coroner inquests on infants or or, or other loved ones and it, you get occasionally get a few sentences from one of the family members and you know it they always speak of of, of their loss and and the love that they had for that person and their devastation so yeah I completely agree I, I think it's um it's actually quite important to point out because I think um some of the literature around that has uh, in the past as well has suggested that um that people didn't grieve in the same way and I think I think maybe they had to get they had to um carry on um mm. because of practical reasons but i don't think that necessarily meant the grief was any less or lesser um yeah. so oh, yeah it's also um the relig religion plays a big part in how people are expected to behave so mm. if you were grieving to an extent you know was permitted but anybody who was thought to be indulging in that was, was questioning god's will because if god had seen fit to remove your family member then who were you to to question that by you know um grieving too much if you like so there was all sorts of sort of constraints there about how you could show yeah. your grief it doesn't mean people inside weren't every bit as heartbroken no and I suppose the other thing is as well you had more people around you who had gone through the, gone yeah. through similar so it was probably a lot easier to talk about I should think losing a child now you know I should think it'd be incredibly lonely experience as well because it's not as common so therefore there's less people who would understand um how you might be feeling so uh you know i suppose on the other hand when people died more often um, and younger you would have had more people to turn to mm. um 
But um, rewinding a little bit to um, the whole um, giving birth experience, one thing that I, I realised I had on my list that I forgot to ask you was um, how was about the, and we touched on it briefly, but um, how did your experience of birth change if you were unmarried? Would you still have had those women? Uh, I know you had your midwife interrogating you in the middle of you. <laughs> <laughs> but would you still have had support around you or were you um, completely cast out? It varies depending on what your circumstances are and you know um, some people's families just take it you know on the on the chin and just accept the child into their family and, and then they so the, the the mother has the same support as anybody else more or less um, but often in um, big urban areas the midwife is paid for by the parish who are very cross about having to spend funds on that sort of thing. And that's where, you know, the, the interrogation bit of it comes from. And um, there is that, definitely is that shame factor of women being turned out left, right and centre. So being being unmarried and alone could, could, was a reality for some women, definitely. I think that's one of the cases where, one of the rare cases where it probably would have been better to have been working class um, I should think it was there was more stigma and more shame attached if you were uh, wealthy and upper class and found yourself uh, unmarried and pregnant than than there was if you were you know working in a factory potentially I'm guessing. <laughs> that, that, that's my, very much my my impression as well because you know not everybody in in um, working class uh, working classes were married you know a lot of people were in that sort of common love it wasn't that that big a deal and there was a lot of fluidity amongst you know, family setups in ways that people think is very modern, but actually isn't. Um, our view has been skewed by, as I say, the, the sort of formalities of the, of the 20th century and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think your, your instinct is exactly right on that one. I'm, I'm sure I read somewhere as well that in some places it was viewed as a, it, it could even be viewed as a good thing if you'd had a child outside of marriage because it proved before you got married that you were fertile. But I don't know that that's... Um, like maybe going a step too far, but uh, maybe maybe possibly occasionally. It's the case that uh, at least a third of brides were pregnant. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, there was a discussion about this on Twitter about, um, and it was related to family history, um, with uh, people saying, um, you know, there's an awful lot of babies born premature. And <laughs> 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 and, uh, and 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 genealogists kind of going mm, it's not premature and um, and some people finding that still quite hard to accept actually that um they might have been six months pregnant when they were mar getting married you know so yeah, um, he, even william shakespeare um you know his his um, wife was heavily pregnant when they got married um he was 18 she was 26 and they had to get married sharpish and, and so, you know, it was, it was very, not. they were particularly unusual in that. And part of that is betrothal was a serious business. If you got engaged to somebody, then it was um, binding. So a lot of people would start a sexual relationship once they got betrothed because they'd made a commitment. Hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so um, I'm just conscious of the time. And I just, um, if anyone has any more questions, please do pop them in the comments. Um, and... Um, could you could you recommend any resources to people? Um, I can see you've got a cover of your book behind you as well. <laughs> um, about where they can go and to find out a bit more um, about yeah. about women in the early modern period and, and their bodies. You know what I wrote because there were so many brilliant stories out there. Um, the gossip choice based on the sort of gossips that I've been talking about, and I turned my hand to fiction writing, and I and I love it. Um, so. I used the stories, um, case studies from a 17th, an 18th century midwife called Sarah Stone, who in 1737 published her case notes um, as part of education of midwives. And so I used some of her stories and dramatised them for the Gossip's Choice. Um, but I also used the midwifery textbook, um, the midwife's book by Jane Sharp in 1671 for the remedies and the cures and the painkillers and, and the, the the ways of going on that midwives would have done. So, um, so you know, if you want, if you like your historical fiction, but you want it to be based in good history, then um, the Gossip's Choice does that. But also things like um, Maids, Wives, Widows, which I published with Pen and Sword back in 2015, is all about women's lives from 1540 to 1740. Lots and lots of goodies in there. Three chapters on women's reproductive life periods, giving birth, pregnancy, afterwards. <laughs> so... That might be a good place to go.
That sounds great. I will, um, there will be a blog post probably out by, or it might be out by Monday because I'm actually away for two days. I'm actually taking two days holiday for the first time in every year <laughs> uh, and having some time off. So rather than being out on Friday, it probably will, will spill over by a day or two. Um, but there will be a blog post. It will be www.genealogystories.co.uk forward slash, and there will most likely be Sarah Reed, and that's Sarah, S-A-R-A. -A. Um, and I'll make sure there'll be um, a copy of this video, but then there'll also be um, an audio version if, you, if you've missed a few bits and you're, you're uh, been flitting in and out eating your dinner, there'll be an audio version so you can catch up another time while you're driving and then there'll be like a list of resources both from Sarah and um, a couple of other bits that I've, I've come across as well so everybody can go and pop over there and find their goodies mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you very much for talking to me I feel like I could um I could carry on asking you loads of loads of questions and I, it would be lovely to talk to you another time about um about that process that you went through actually of of um writing a fictional book but making sure it's historically accurate i think that would be really interesting um i'd love to hear your thoughts on that so thank you so much for joining us um and oh just a few people here saying um that they're looking forward to popping on that blog post and looking up your your books and jane here Jane, I'm so glad you made it, Jane. Jane, Jane Blesser makes every single session, even though she's the other side of the world. So <laughs> I'm always really impressed because it's really early in the morning where she is. So thanks, Jane. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks for um, joining me. And um, and uh, I'll get that blog post up as quick as I possibly can. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye. And this is where I press the end broadcast button and it takes ages and it's really awkward. <laughs>